Hi everybody. So it's Wednesday, um, the daily pursuit. Sometimes I think maybe I should call it the weekly pursuit, but nah, because what I like to talk about, even though I do this every week, it's really about issues that are, you know, daily in nature. Uh, nature. So that's kind of what I want to focus on. So today, um, I kind of just wanted to talk from my heart a little bit about something that I've personally been encountering lately and um, it's not unique to me by any stretch we all face it but it's just really been something that I've noticed more lately than I had in the past and by the way if you hear background noise and stuff I'm sitting out on my front porch and kind of loving the outdoor thing so yeah, so if you hear something, you know what. And if I suddenly like take off and run, it's because a bee buzzed me. I actually tried to record this earlier today on the back deck, and I got about halfway through, and this bee literally started like doing laps around my head. So there you go. There's a daily pursuit. Anyway, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this issue of um, how we treat other people and what it really means in terms of... Uh, how we govern ourselves and I'll explain more about what I mean by that a little bit later in this discussion for the day so most of you who know me personally know that I am a university teacher I've actually been one for 20 years it's hard for me sometimes to wrap my brain around that because 20 years comes and goes so quickly I was just you know this young kid barely out of college myself when I got the job and I've been doing it for all these years and uh, I have a hard time believing sometimes that I have now officially finished 20 years but that's a whole different subject for another day so today um, I want to talk about this other thing I do on the side which is a customer service job now I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about it because you know technically we're not supposed to talk a lot about the details it's you know it's business you keep the business within the business but it is a customer service job in the travel industry um, Tim also does it he does it like a full-time thing for me it's just a part-time you know some extra pocket money on the side but for Tim it's like it's his main job so he does it and deals with it even more than I do um, so it's the first time that I've worked in a customer service field per se I've been in the education world for 20 years and um, so in a sense my students are my customers but there is definitely a different feel about it that way in the customer service world it's very very different and for those of you who have worked in the restaurant industry or other customer service fields you know what I'm talking about some days you get customers that are an absolute blessing and they just make your world go round like one day I got a call into my customer service job and this lady started telling me Bible jokes and I just thought it was so much fun okay, so she didn't know me from Adam but she was just bound to have a good time with you know whoever she was talking with on the phone and it just made my day but then you get some customers that test every ounce of patience that you have and then some so I've been thinking a lot lately about this concept of perceived anonymity and that's a term I first heard actually in my teaching classroom when I invited in um, an old high school friend who I've known pretty much most of my life he uh, works at the college as well and uh, in the information technology uh, s department not like teaching it but actually doing it and so he came in to do some talks in my classes and he was discussing um, the topic of hacking and so one of the things that he talked about was this concept of perceived anonymity and what it really means is that in our world if we can see someone face to face most of the time we treat them differently than if we can't see them at all in other words if they're on the phone or if they're behind a chat screen and we're chatting with them 
then we have a tendency to not see them as a real person on the other side of the screen. And I've run into that a lot because in this customer service side hustle that I do, um, at first I started by answering phones and answering questions and helping people with their problems that way. And then I moved to the chat version where, you know, there's the little thing down in the corner of your screen that says click here for live chat. Well, I'm one of those people on the other side of that live chat box. And so I've discovered that on both of those phone and chat, people can be very difficult to deal with when they call in, they've had a bad day, they're you know reservation didn't go the way they wanted to or something like that and they're in a bad mood but usually you can have some sympathy or empathy because they're they're having a bad day they're tired they're worn out things aren't going well we've all been there you know we've all experienced the same thing at some point and on some level but then I've noticed that the ones who chat in they're a whole different ball game now some of them are nice as can be and you feel like you're you know texting with your old buddies but then some of them are just rude as can be and it has nothing to do with you personally but they make it personal real fast you know this and that and it's all your fault and some of them will cuss you out some of them will call you names some of them will tell you you're you know you're stealing their money if they can't get a refund because they didn't do something right um, and I see this really ugly sense of entitlement in in the public world and I just you know I said in one of a, a previous video that Tim and I did that I've often been called like a Pollyanna sort and I just kind of try to look for the best in people and in situations and this particular job has shown me the ugly side of human relationship and that is that if I don't know you and you don't know me then I can treat you however I want to and that is such an entitled and ugly attitude but I see it frequently and so whereas I used to think that rudeness and frustration and anger towards somebody that you don't even know I used to think that was rare and it was the exception to the rule but what I'm seeing through this particular job is that it's actually much more common than I realized and the other day as I thought about it I just had a really rough you know interaction with one of my customers and I was frustrated and I was at first I admit I was angry like I was so mad I just wanted to tell them off but that was my flesh and I didn't tell them off but after I finished the exchange I sat there and I thought what a sad state that the human mind is in these days um, and I, I began to understand that it's a deeper issue than just respect for people that we don't know or that we that we can't see and so I began thinking and trying to process that and, and try to make some sense of what I was experiencing and not just for myself as someone in the customer service industry but also someone who is just a member of the human race and what I began to see is the reality of 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 um, and I'm gonna go there now and so in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, um, I'm going to start at verse 1 just because I want to point out something here. We think that perceived anonymity is maybe something that's new with the advent of the internet, you know, or being able to have conversation with somebody that we can't see, but it's really not. And we see that right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, and he says, Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when, you're abs when absent. 
I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. So here Paul is even saying that there's this perception of me one way when I'm writing to you, and there's another perception of me when I'm face to face to you. Um, and so even he acknowledges a little bit of that, which I call perceived anonymity. But what it really is, is it's distance between the individual and the person to whom they're speaking. And so he acknowledges that there is some of that. But he goes on to say in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And here's where I want to go, and here's kind of where I want to focus for a little bit. And that is uh, verse 6 and 7. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Think about that. We're destroying speculations. Some versions of this or some translations say we are casting down imaginations. Now, if you know me, you know that when I study the Bible or read the Bible, if I see a word or a phrase or a term that I'm not familiar with, I like to dig into it and see exactly what it means. So I kept thinking about, you know, I grew up with the King James and it says casting down imaginations. And this version, which is the New American Standard, it says we're destroying speculations. Okay, so that would lump destroying and casting down together. And that would put speculations and imaginations together. So when you look at the term, we are destroying or casting down. I thought there's more to that. I could feel it. I knew there was. And so I pulled it up and I began to study it in the original Greek. And the original Greek word for we are destroying or casting down is kathario. Kathario. And that particular word is the same word that's used for taking down as in specifically without violence taking down something but most specifically it means to detach from the cross so we're taking down from the cross speculations and animations and i'm, I'm going to go back to that so hold on to that thought taking down or detaching from the cross it's the exact same word that was used when they refer to taking down Jesus off the cross. That is specifically what that word means. All right. So now bearing with me, I'm going to go back and we're going to look at the word speculations or uh, imaginations. And with that, that's the Greek word logismos, which is where we get our word for logic. And it specifically means a reckoning or a computation or a reasoning such as hostile to the Christian faith. It can also mean a judgment. It can mean a decision. And it means such as conscience passes. So speculations, imaginations, that same word, it's translated both of those ways. But it comes from logismos or logic, which basically means to human thinking and the way that we think and reason and um, judge things, as in um, make a decision about something. And so as I was thinking about that, and, and also thinking about, you know, this term, every lofty thing, every lofty thing, that means anything that's elevated, whatever it happens to be, anything that's elevated, a lofty thing, it can be a structure, like a barrier or a rampart. It could be, you know, lifting something up into space, whatever. It's something that's elevated. It's the object of the act of elevation, okay? Okay. 
So every lofty thing, every raised up thing, and then speaking of raised up, this is crazy. All right, y'all ready for this? I get excited about breaking down Bible verses and actually understanding. Raised up does not mean simply to just hold up in the air. It is specifically the same term that is used when it talks about um, raising up the cross. So this whole passage is a picture of how we are to live our life when we're um, in, in conversation and in relationship with people. We are to destroy or take down from the cross. In other words, speculations and imaginations and every lofty thing that's been raised up or crucified against the knowledge of Christ, we take those down dead and we take those things captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, exactly what is the obedience of Christ? The obedience of Christ is dying to those things that would be exalted against the knowledge of God. Jesus himself allowed himself to be so obedient to the will of the Father that he even was allowed, he allowed himself to be raised up and then cast down. He was up on the cross and he was taken down. He went up to die. He came down dead to be resurrected. All right. That's important. And I know it seems like that might not have anything to do with this customer service thing, but it does. And here's why. If we go to Galatians chapter 5, um, and we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit passage. Now we can look at, if we want to, the deeds of the flesh. That starts in Galatians 5 verse 19. And it talks about, from verses 19 through 21, it talks about everything that is an act of the flesh or a work of the flesh, or as the NASB says, the deeds of the flesh. And it's things like immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, and on and on and on. Okay, that includes... Um, dissensions, strife, outburst of anger, disputes, all of those things are works of the flesh. And so as I've dealt with customers who are frustrated and angry, I see what's in the heart of humanity. I see it come pouring out and I see just how much of the flesh is actually in the world. And when you have a customer who is disputing with you, over something that was very clearly defined, um, you know, a restriction on a particular arrangement, and they just want it their way. They want it to be done their way. They want to be the exception to the rule. And then they get into um, strife with you, and they argue, which is dissensions. They, they dispute with you, and they have outbursts of anger. They call you names. Um, those are all works of the flesh. And so when you're a human and you're in a flesh body, like I am, the temptation is to want to treat them back the way that they treat me. And I think if we're being honest, we've all kind of felt that way at some point. We just want to tell somebody off. But if we read Galatians 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here it comes, self-control. Against such things there is no law. See, the law, as we understand the law, speaks to the deeds of the flesh. The law is what shows us the ugliness of the deeds of the flesh. Things like immorality, impurity, sorcery, enmity, all those things. I'm skipping around there. Okay, but the law shows us the ugliness of those things. However, against the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law. 
Now, it's the fruit of the Spirit, and it's a capital S. So it's talking about the Holy Spirit. All right, it's not talking about our human spirit. Our human spirit is still locked into a body of flesh, and it's being transformed daily. That's that whole daily pursuit thing. Okay, so it is being transformed daily. However, the fruit of the Spirit is something that can only grow out of the Holy Spirit's work in our life. See, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those things are not things that come out of our spirit. Those things come out of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. So, when we're good, it's not because we're good. It's because the Holy Spirit is good through us. And the more that we submit to that life, the more of these fruit or the more this fruit will be demonstrated in our lives. And so the big one for me lately, I'm just being real, is self-control. Because my, my, my human flesh and my spirit, the little s, wants to tell off um, customers that are giving me a hard time. But the Holy Spirit, the big S, at work in my life, doesn't want me to do that. And so, when I crucify, in other words, when I um, take down everything that's been raised up, so my flesh wants to raise up and fight back with these customers, but... The Holy Spirit helps me to take it down. Helps me to crucify it as it's raised up and then take it down. So that the fruit of self-control is what's actually resurrected in my behavior and my actions. Self-control is powerful. And at some point, I'm probably going to talk about that in another one of these episodes. But not today because I don't want to get into too much detail. But I will say this much. One of the major issues that we're dealing with in our society today is the notion of self-control. See, a lot of people look to the government to fix our problems. And we can say we're supposed to look to God to fix our problems. And there is an element of truth to that. But when we truly submit ourselves to a life governed by God, then in a sense we become self-governing. And what I mean by that is if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us, and if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to truly be the, the element that really drives our life, so to speak, then we're governed by that. So we're being governed from within. And if we're leading a life of self-control, governed from within, we don't have to rely as much on the laws of, of the, this world. The laws of this world have been put into place because people weren't practicing self-governance. See, God places within us what we need in order to adequately self-govern ourselves. He's placed within us these fruit of the Spirit, in particular self-control. In and of ourselves, we don't have the power to maintain. We just don't. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we do. When we're thinking about even the laws of the land, some of them um, are are just common sense if we really think about it. But so many people want to be the exception to the rule. They still just want to do things their way. And they do that because the fruit of the Spirit is not an operation in their life. Or the fruits of the Spirit are not an operation in their life. And it's because they're not submitting. They haven't allowed those things that have been raised up to be cast down. They've not allowed them to be crucified on the cross and then brought down off the cross. 
See, we're supposed to live a crucified and brought down life. But, and that sounds all pitiful, but it's really not. That's the most powerful way to live a life is to live a life crucified to the deeds of the flesh. Because if you live a life crucified to the deeds of the flesh, then you can't help but live a life that is full of the fruit of the Spirit. And that's when self-governance becomes easier. It becomes easy to deal with difficult situations and difficult people and difficult things when we have the fruit of self-control to help us do that. I, I think about that a lot. I think about it more than I ever have. Uh, and again, part of that is simply because I look at this customer service job, which is kind of new to me. Um, but I also look at just the, the state of things in the world, the recent riots. I believe that there has been injustice done, but the way to combat injustice is not by exhibiting the practice of a lack of self-control. That's actually contrary to fruitful progress. I look at great people like Martin Luther King and he changed the face of our nation and he did it with this concept of nonviolence. See when you live a crucified life you don't have to fight back because you're already dead. So what you do is instead of fighting back you simply sit back and you ask the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to exhibit His fruit. How do I change this situation through the fruit of the Holy Spirit? I know that I can't change it for the better through the deeds of the flesh. So how do I change this situation by employing the power of the Holy Spirit and the fruit that's born from that? So I'm going to leave you with that for this week. Um, it's something that I hope you ponder more. I know I'll definitely be pondering it more because uh, it's something that's pretty heavy on my heart these days. When I look at our world and I see what appears to be a growing spirit of lawlessness. And we know that that's an indicator of the times we live in. And maybe I'll talk about that at some point too. But for now, I'm going to let you go. And I hope you have a beautiful rest of your week and a wonderful 4th of July this weekend. Blessings and shalom, y'all.